Adrian, thanks for joining me on today's Spotlight. So it's Adrian Maxwell from Fracino. Adrian, over to you. Introduce us to your business, please. No problem, Andy. Uh, obviously, my name's Adrian Maxwell. I'm the MD here at Fracino. Uh, we are a family business. We've been going for uh, over 60 years now. My father started it in 1963 from uh, the garden shed. So we've come a long way in that sort of time. Uh, my daughter's also working in the business now as well, um, which is very nice. And at various times, the other children have had a little dabble at doing bits and pieces of work, but have moved on, unfortunately, into other fields. Uh, but we're still going strong. Uh, we are predominantly the only espresso and cappuccino coffee machine manufacturer in the UK. All our competition comes from overseas. So mainly, obviously, Italy and Spain and France, with a few other oddball things in America and uh, other various places with a few oddball machines made. But we are unique here. Um, and we are basically a big engineering company. Uh, we manufacture about 80% of all of our components in-house. That's from bodywork, chassis, boilers, pipe work, everything here, full assembly shop, full test shop. Um, and that's really the, the the level we're at. And that's where we want to be. We enjoy it. Um, we've got new stuff coming through all the time. So uh, plenty to look at. Absolutely. So you may have already partially answered this question, I guess, Adrian. But what would you say makes you stand out from your competition? Uh, that's a very good question, Andy. Uh, I think two unique things. One is that we are not just like a lot of manufacturers, and certainly in the car industry, you see it where people just buy in parts and just put it together. They don't actually make anything. Um, and that we're not an assembly shop. That is not what we are. And so that unique feature of actually being able to manufacture anything you need in the, in a short space of time, I don't have to order a part and then wait three weeks lead time, four weeks lead time for it to arrive or ship it in from China or wherever you're going to get that part from. I know if we run out of a sheet metal fabricated part, we can literally load a sheet onto the machine, laser cut it, fold it and put it onto a machine under an hour. Now that gives you huge versatility and speed when you're trying to make specific things or specific models. And it's given us a real edge. And as uh, as I've already mentioned, that uh, in the COVID period, when we were struggling, and I know, I mean, we as in the country were struggling to get product, we were still able to manufacture. We were still able to turn products out. And if people wanted machines, they could get them from us. Um, and it was quite interesting to see that our competition, whilst they had a bit of stop maybe to start with, once that dried up, they just couldn't get product. And people were waiting months and months and months for parts. And so for us going forward, which is one of the things that we promote in the businesses, you don't have to worry here if you're in the UK. Every single part is on the shelf. We're still fixing machines that are 30 and nearly 40 years old because we've got parts to do it. You know, if you haven't got it, we'll make it for you. We can always get it working again. It's kind of that scenario. Um, and you're never going to pay over the odds for it. And the, the products that we make are well engineered. We have really good price um, quality ratio. So everything is metal. We don't use much plastic on the machines. Our competition tend to use a lot of plastic panels, which when you're giving the machine a hide in a cafe or a bar or a restaurant and it get knocked about, they look really untidy very, very quickly. And after a short period of time, a machine that's only you know eight or 10 months old looks like it's 20 years old. Our machines, you can bring them in, you can strip them, clean them, rebuild them, put them back out again. You get another 10 years of service out of it. And we had a scenario with one of our chains that we deal with that had a, a foreign maker machine before we started dealing with them. Um, and apparently the, the machine broke, it was only two years old. And the reply that they got from the agent that was selling the machine was, well, you use the machine too much. That was the reply. And we were absolutely flabbergasted. So obviously yeah. they said, would this happen with yours? And we were like, no. <laughs> you know, 10 years we might be saying to you, well, you've used the machine a fair bit now. We've got a choice now. You can strip it and rebuild it and put it back in. It might cost you a thousand pounds, 1,500 quid or a new one for 3,000. You know, that's your decision. But we certainly wouldn't be saying, oh, you've used it too much after two years. That's just ridiculous. Mm. But that's kind of where they are. And if you use a lot of plastic bits and pieces on the machines, they will crack and break. And then they charge the earth for a panel and something like this. Whereas if you use like us, all our panels are standing still. You know, okay, you might dent it, but it's never going to fall apart. Mm. You know, and that, that is the difference. And so we've kind of always gone that route. We've absolutely made a point that we will not go down the plastic route. Yes, you can put some pretty shapes and stuff into it, and it's quite cheap to make them. But the, the outcome is that that machine will have a short life. It might be the wrong thing because it prevents you from reselling new machines. But I think that we've always prided ourselves on a British-made product. And it's like the old Land Rover syndrome. You know, they've still got 80% of their original Land Rovers they made in the, in the late 40s, early 50s, still working. And we're kind of on that route. Well, it's British, it's strong, and it'll keep going. And I think that's what the name's sort of, and the brand's been built on. Great. Very cool. Good to hear. No problem.
So 60 year heritage, 60 and a bit. Um, yeah. What about where the business is going? What's the aspirations for the next sort of five years? Uh, for the next five, well, I mean, we've obviously been growing enormously over the last sort of uh, 10 to 12 years anyway. I mean, we've more than doubled in size from where we were. Uh, there's still potential for growth. I think the main thing we've got to do is watch that we keep control, which we've spoke about briefly. Uh, that's a big issue, and I see it with a lot of companies. Uh, we noticed as well, we did a, an exhibition in Milan uh, October last year, which is the probably the biggest show in the world for espresso coffee machines. And our competition was this probably maybe 140, 150 different manufacturers of espresso machines at varying levels. Um, we're quite strong there in that field. Uh, bear in mind, we are unique as in, we're the only ones in the UK. Um, but what we're seeing with a lot of the companies now is they're all being bought, the old family businesses are all being bought by big groups, yeah. uh, such as Evoca and Ryomi and Ali Group. These are big, big, big Italian companies that have maybe two or 300 companies under their umbrella. But what happens is it loses its face. It loses its control. And uh, I think there's probably only two or three independent espresso machine companies left now, which is really unusual. Mm -hmm. um, what it does is obviously keeps us unique in as much that we're apart from a big group, which might put, uh, you know, continuity of parts in where you're buying this machine, that machine, the other machine, they've all got the same valve in them. You know, we, we have our own stuff. That's the thing. We are unique, like we talked about um, in the previous question. But I think for us moving forward in the next five years is to continue doing what we're doing. We have a whole new range of machines coming out, which we're bringing out as a new brand called Aston, um, which we've registered. This is to complement our current range, which probably is a um, medium range of machines in price and quality. So we don't go at the bottom level price wise. We're certainly not at the top, but this is to go at the high level. So this is barista machines, some for home, absolutely beautiful pieces of bar furniture. Um, so we're making them so they're stunning to look at. Um, work absolutely impeccably, obviously, with all the latest control gear in, lots of electronics because that's what people are asking for. But obviously, a premium price with that. So that's why we separated the range. Uh, I mean, this is due to launch this year, so we are very close to doing And there's about five new models to come out, plus a new bean to cut machine, mm -hmm. uh, which we've been in that market um, properly for, you know, years and years and years. So we're going to have a good push with that. And I think with what we've designed and developed, um, again, that the machine will be serviceable. Uh, it will be able to be maintained by any service engineer, not by a specific one, because a lot of them make it very difficult for you to repair them. So it's uh, you buy it from whoever, and then you have to have them to service it, and then you can only get the spares from them, and there's no technical help, and it kind of becomes a bit of a, a rip-off, really, uh, where your service costs are through the roof. Yeah, yeah. We, we, we've we always made a policy that anybody wants a spare part, and that, you, even if you wanted a spare part, Andy, we supply with a part. We don't have any issues with it. I think it's the worst thing you can do to lock it down and say, no, you've got to buy it through this, you've got to buy it through that. No, we don't do that. Yeah. Um, so our, our growth then will come from the new range, uh, the bean to cup, and then obviously constantly looking for new markets. So we're constantly looking for export markets around the world. There's 200 countries around the world that you can export to. We do about 70 of them um, and growing. Uh, it's just keep keep fighting that that corner really. So we still want to grow. We still want to keep going. We still run it as a family business. We still everybody still is a person. They're not just a number. Everybody knows me. I know them, and I think that's uh, the way we want to keep it. Great, very cool. What would you say your biggest learning's been since you've been a business owner, Adrian? Well, uh, <laughs> yeah, big one, right? <laughs> yeah, uh, you. I think first thing you've got to say is that you are constantly learning. So you never, ever stop learning. Uh, every day is a school day. Uh, and it's amazing the things that you find out. You think you know a lot. I mean, they call me the Oracle here, but that's probably because I've just been doing it for so long. You know, I've been a good engineer. I mean, a lot of people say I'm you know, one of the best espresso engineers in the world, but that's probably because I've been doing it the longest. You know, There are very few espresso machine companies that have even been going as long as us. Most of them are new. You've got the um, Italian brand, but they're still not the same company they were because the family are gone. They've been bought three or four times, and that's yeah. not the same. Um, so I think that uh, engineering wise, I've got good knowledge, but we're still learning new techniques. We're constantly updating stuff, new software. It's a modern world now. It's a CAD generated world. It's a computer aided engineering world. Um, and I've had to learn that, which I didn't know when I was did my apprenticeship. We didn't have any of that. We didn't even have a, a you know computer to draw with. I'm still drawing with a pencil and a drawing board. You know, and that's not that long ago. You know, it, it's forty odd years, but it's not that long ago. You know, and we were still doing it the old way. So things have constantly come on. But I think the biggest 
thing learning is how to read people, how to read your staff. I found that the most difficult because obviously I'm an engineer. I'm not an HR person. I've never studied it. Um, I obviously have to do some work on it and learn a lot. But I think I've learned that um, I need to treat people and I do treat people the way I would want to be treated. And I always look at it from both sides of the, of the story. So I look at it from my point of view, from a business point of view, and look at it from their point of view, how they feel they've been treated. And I think that stood me in good stead. But it's took a long time to get to that level. And I think when you're younger, you don't understand that. So I'm sure you've saw it when you were in your 20s and then you grow and you learn. We were completely different people then to what we are today. Probably yeah. the king. I think that's probably where my dad um, was here. So he had that skill and that knowledge. Obviously, the business was much smaller um, and on a lesser scale. So it wasn't so imperative that he knew that stuff. But he was here to guide. And then he left me just doing what I was doing and obviously learning and learning and learning and learning, building up my skills in the business to be able to run the business at the level that it needed to be run at. I think the the issue with a lot of people, certainly young people starting the business, they don't know that. So they end up having to get other people. And it depends on the type of business you're in. I think if you're retail stuff and you're buying stuff in and selling, it's very different. It's, it's kind of buy a box, sell a box and make some money. And as long as you look after the customer, it's okay. You don't have so many management skills. But when you're trying to manufacture and you've got a, your your labor force is quite heavily involved in the business and it's imperative that you have a labor force i can't make machines without labor you know as much as we like to automate things and as much as i can automate as much as i can we still yeah. have to have a, 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 a human input and for that we need to control that and so that's probably been my biggest learn and i think that dad waited until i was probably i'm trying how long have i been doing this now running it properly since 2007 so you know we're coming up to 17 years of running it now um, and I think that when he handed it over at that point that I suddenly realized, oh yeah, I actually can do the job. I thought I could do it before, mm. but you can't. And it's funny, my daughter talks to me and she's in her, her mid thirties now and she's got children and I can see the change from when she joined us when right. she was nine to where she is today. She's a different lady. She's learned a lot. I've told her a lot of things that she's took on board, um, and she's a different person at this age to to where she was at 19. Yeah, She's capable of running stuff and running the office and running the HR. And she's good at it. Um, and she's got a good personality as well. She's very bubbly. So it kind of comes and works works well. But it's interesting that she's grown in that time. And I've got another lady here that's very similar age to Beck, um, Hayley, who's been with me since she was 18. And she's a different girl to where she was when she was 18. Yeah. Not hot-headed. You know, we're all like it when we're younger. You know, it's just, uh, we just got to get it done. But you learn to control that. And I think that's that's kind of where we are today. And I, yeah, everything chucked at me, but I, I just can handle it now. I think that's the difference. Broad shoulder. So I think that's the biggest learner. Good stuff. So those broad shoulders then, what's the biggest challenge you've had to overcome? Uh, I'd say COVID was the biggest challenge, uh, without a shadow of a doubt. Mm. Uh, I'll be honest, we were... Before it happened, obviously, there was that bit of a run-up three or four weeks before, and I was trying to make, um, in my head, to get a plan together. Uh, I even sat down with my dad, obviously, and said, you know, this is where we are. You know, most important thing I need to do is look after the staff. That was the primary uh, importance to us over the business. We need to look after everybody. And so we sort of I developed a, about a six-week plan because we had no idea why this was going. There was nothing said at the time. Yeah. And I thought, we can probably survive for about six weeks um, with the staff not working, maybe up to three months with cash reserves um, because I always have a rainy day fund. It's just something that we've always done. And I thought, okay, if we can survive at, at, at three months and then see where we are from there, and then and then we will need to do something drastic, whether it's laid people off or what. So I put this plan into place, um, which we got here, and I thought for the first couple of weeks, we'll split the workforce in half segregate it half in half out half on holiday make sure everybody's paid so they've got money they need to eat pay their bills and then um, boris announced the furlough scheme which was really a massive savior um to be honest because i think we would have struggled i think we'd have survived but i think we would have struggled and it was a massive relief for me i'll be honest with you i had sleepless nights i was really worried because i thought if they just turn this off our switch is going to go off and it did you know they turned it off and our switch went off because nobody's out, nobody's eating, nobody's drinking, nobody wants coffee. Having said that, it did pick up, as I said to you previously, we did sort of get a turn on quite rapidly um, with home market, people wanting to drink at home. And our, our domestic machine sales went up 550% to give you an idea, which is why we had to get people in and start manufacturing. Sure. And we also did a lot with, um, if you remember in the July, he brought out that, that people could serve takeaway. 
Yeah. And so all of a sudden, uh, we promoted our gas machines, which were mobile, so you could just stick it in the back of a van and make coffee. And people were going around doing coffee rounds around the streets. And people were literally queuing up, going to a cul-de-sac, park your van up, and they'd have a queue of people queuing, two metre gap between them, to get a cup of coffee. Yeah. So there was a bit of withdrawal because people like coffee. Da, da, da. Yeah. And so we had a uplift in our gas machine sales. They went quite well, quite well as well. Nowhere near where we needed to be, but we were we were working. And that's why I said to you, within three months, we were, you know, 60% back into business, which was great. So we were then able to survive, no problem. But I think that bit and that thing was just really, really difficult to yeah. comprehend, get your head around and think, how the hell are we going to get out of this mess? Yeah. Um, and it did come out. You know, we got out of it. Um, and we came out, as I said, stronger than ever, which is good. Um, and I think that's uh, that's something that you need to learn. Oh, God forbid anything like that ever happens again. But it was... Um, I suppose it gave us all an, an idea of what can happen if things do go wrong, you know, on a worldwide basis. You know, and they were, we were a lot better off than others. I mean, it was in a terrible state. You know, there were just so many deaths um, by suppliers that we, we talked to and lost family and things. It was just very sad, very yeah, sad. Absolutely. So if you were to uh, be sitting having a conversation with your 18-year-old self with the benefit of the knowledge you've got now, what would you say? Well, that's kind of back to where I was with my daughter, as I said to you, when she was 19 and she joined, um, you know, the aggression, the hot-headed, uh, mm. losing the temper with people, um, all that kind of things. When I joined, and I mean, obviously I was doing my apprenticeship when I was 18, so it was a little bit different. I worked in a big industry. Um, I found it highly frustrating, highly frustrating working in a big industry. Um, uh, I'm a Rolls apprentice, so, you know, fantastic training, absolutely brilliant on that. But the red tape that we had to deal with when I was there was ridiculous. Yeah. And I found it really frustrating. And that got me, and that's where it comes, this this anger and this frustration, because you're trying to do better, you're being held back. And I think as a as an 18-year-old from where I am now, I'd be saying, right, this is what I think you need to do. You need to be cool, calm, collected. You need to think before you speak. You need uh-huh. to think about everything you do. You write something, you don't send it, you write, reread it. You put yourself in the other person's shoes that's receiving that and look at it. And they're all the things that I've actually said to staff here, particularly the younger ones. Look, before you do these things, don't do it. Hard. Stop, wait, think. Actually think about it. if you receive what you've just written there. OK, they've cheesed you off. I get they've cheesed you off. Totally understand it. But at the end of the day, it might be a customer. Yeah. And you've got to look at it and turn it around and say, if you then sent that to them, if you were that person receiving that email or that that message, how would you feel? Yeah. Really? Because it reads really badly. But if we change a couple of words in there, it actually reads completely differently and the outcome is completely different. Yeah. And I said the good thing, which I also um, teach all the young ones, is stop writing stuff. Pick up the phone and have a yeah. conversation. Because yeah. the con- in a conversation, much the same as you and I are talking now, you're getting the context of my conversation. I'm getting the context of your conversation. We can see each other. It's completely different to me writing something to you. Absolutely. And then I said, you'll get a much better reaction if you speak to somebody. Just be kind, polite. You'll get the best out of somebody. If you want something done, I can ask you something in the same same words, in two different ways. One will get a reaction where they absolutely fly off the handle at you. And they'll be, of course I'll do it for you. That's right. Simple as that. I think that's something that, you know, going back to when I was 18, I mean, I've, I'm a pretty calm guy anyway. I'm quite a gentle guy. But but I was more hot-headed then, uh-huh. you know. And today, yeah. that, that just wouldn't happen today, Andy. I just... I just don't get like that. I just, I probably kick. I probably go quiet. That's probably most of my thing today. I'll just go quiet because I'm thinking. I even say it to somebody. And they look at me. It's quite funny. They'll come in and they'll say something to me, and they'll go, and they'll just be waiting for an answer. And I just, and then I look and I'll go. I'm thinking, just wait. And I just say, and I'll say, I'll come back to you on that because I have to think about it now. Completely yeah. different way. Yeah, yeah. Just, I've just changed. I know I've changed. Yeah. We all do, don't we? So of what's course. the one piece of advice that you give to other business owners who are watching this, Adrian? If you just had to encapsulate one thing, what would it be? Uh, the biggest advice to business owners that are running businesses is I would say make sure that you are not, as a business, carrying too much debt. I think that's one of the biggest downfalls for any business. If you want to survive, I've proved it here. We've been survived. We've survived 61 years. We're strong. We've got a good, good base, um, you know, if you're carrying too much debt, you're going to struggle. It's always going to be a problem. It's going to bite you on the bum at some point. Yes, it's lovely to have a new car and all the rest of it and have fancy premises, but if you can't afford it or business drops and you're trading level, which is great, that's fantastic, put yep. some in the pot for the rainy day, and then when it comes out, you'll have it there. And then grow it slowly. So if you can't afford it, don't do it. 
So we've always made it, and the uh, and this would probably come from dad from years ago. We run the business a bit like you run your home. So if I can't afford to buy something, I don't have it. If I need a new machine tool now, okay, in the early days we used to finance, but now what I'll do, I'll wait, make sure we've, we've saved up enough money in the fund and we'll buy it. Done. I don't have to worry about it then. So if we do have a problem like COVID, I haven't got massive finance repayments to make. Yeah. I'm not in, you know, sat outside. I heard a couple of service companies that had 50 odd vans that were on contract hire. Still got to pay the contract hire when you're on like that. Right, and they, they've got no work coming in. So you've got massive overhead. I had five or six vans or nine vans or whatever we got here, uh, but nothing financed. So they can just sit there. It didn't, it didn't matter. Okay, you got a bit of tax and insurance on, but it's not like paying three, four hundred pounds a month on ten vehicles. You know, it's thousands of pounds. There's nothing coming in the in the in the pot. You're struggling. Yeah. But I think that's my biggest piece of advice. Be very careful what you borrow. Yeah. I know you have to sometimes to get things done. I totally understand that. Make sure it's manageable and get rid of the debt as soon as you can. Yeah, great advice. Thank you. No problem. Adrian, thank you for your insights. Um, brilliant to hear about the success of the British business. Isn't that cool? Um, all of your website details will be sitting down below this video. So anybody who wants to find out more, get in touch, um, can absolutely go in that way, I guess. That's probably the best way to do it, isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah, um, no problem. So, to help. Um, thanks for sharing your journey. The uh, Wishing you loads of success with the next five years and the conquering of the other 130 countries you haven't got to yet. And okay. <laughs> absolutely and um yeah thanks for sharing today no problem Andy. very nice to speak to you thank you thanks